Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash usingyourpower. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And today I'd like to recommend Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity by David Allen. Learn how a paper-based system can increase your productivity. Welcome to Using Your Power. My name is Maveen Cora. And I'm David Andrew Eve. Awesome, David. How are you? Great, thanks. How are you today? I'm doing very well, man. Uh, what are you up to to this week? So much. I mean, really? Yeah. I was on Tucker's podcast a little while back talking about how I felt I was at capacity already, and the only way to grow was to grow my own capacity or grow my team. Well, I've had to grow my capacity this week. Wow. So, because I know you're, before uh, we started this, you were telling me you, you might be taking on a couple of new projects here to kind of just yeah. keep adding on to a little bit more of what you're doing and uh, continuing to uh, streamline your process in the meantime. That's right. I mean, sm- some of them are smaller commitments, like playing music at our regular question community gathering, which will be three or four songs. You know, I'm performing regularly enough to where that's not necessarily a big deal, but all the way over to possibly some large-scale blog posts, more pre-interviews than normal. You were here while I was doing one of those pre-interviews earlier today and other client work that I'm doing. So, yeah, there's a lot. Well, that's awesome, yeah. And, you know, thanks for letting me sit on on the interview because I don't know, you know, if we're allowed to do that. But it was uh, pretty neat because like, it really gave me an idea of how you uh, go through that interview process, w- you know, what kind of questions you're asking. Uh, you know, it just really helps me open up to, you know, good questions that are being asked because, you know, that's one of the things that we talked about in a prior episode as well is asking good questions makes a huge difference to making not only yourself look good as the person asking the question, but make the person you're interviewing look even better than you are looking on that on that uh, interview I guess yeah and to be fair we are discussing the same information that will eventually be released on a proper podcast episode so as long as you know the person that I'm working with decides to go ahead with that podcast interview there's really nothing confidential there necessarily right so I guess you know the question is what are we talking about today David we're going to take a look at how to organize your workspace. And you have a little bit of a background on why we're going to be covering this topic, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of my friends, uh, really good friends, I've known him for well over, uh, God, almost uh, 20 some years here. And uh, he brought this to me directly. You know, he, st- he uh, messaged me and said, you know, I'd, I'd, uh, I've listened to a lot of your episodes with yourself nice. and David. And, you know, there's one thing that I find at my own work and he works uh, for the government. So he's like, you know, I find that a lot of people there aren't organized. So you sa- he was saying, you know, if there was an episode or a podcast where people could tune into and find ways to be organized, I think that would be very helpful for them. And I said, absolutely, we'll uh, put something together for you and let you know when it comes out. So thanks uh, thanks for the, uh, um, you know, podcast information there, Rajiv. Yeah, and the lesson there is if you come to us with ideas for a show, we might just do it. Yeah, absolutely. And why not, right? There's nothing wrong because it tells us exactly what our listeners are looking to, uh, you know, get from what we're telling them and what type of information they're looking for. So, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's nice, you know, to give people information about spiritual stuff or, you know, how to brand and how to do social media, but not not always what they're looking for, right? They're sometimes looking for something a little bit more simplistic, something they can implement right away. So if there are topics that our listeners want to listen uh, listen to and, and uh, find ways to implement right away, you know, definitely hit us on Twitter, Facebook, and uh, on our website as well and let us know. Nor do we want to just teach on social media. I mean, we might love to talk about it, but (laughs) the results that you get from social media, people overestimate all the time. Well, this is the tool to make me go viral. This is what's going to make me famous. This is what's going to get me business results. And you know, the thing that I've seen over and over again, we can waste a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy on social media without getting a lot of results. I mean, and I do ads for people. I do ads for communities. I do ads for musicians. I do ads for businesses. And yeah, that gets them more results than and perhaps just sharing organically but the difference the difference is like those people also understand that social media is not necessarily going to put butts in seats if it comes to that event or it comes to show date hopefully it will that is the goal the thing that it number one thing that it does is it builds awareness and keeps you relevant in today's day and age and that's why it's important i think no absolutely and that's the best way that's the best place to uh 
um, find your listeners because that's where they are, right? They're on their exactly. social media platforms, and and that's why we're there as well, right? So obviously we're we're going to talk about just about everything that uh, we can think of, and we're going to think of the best examples we can bring up. So uh, you know, just kind of moving that along. What's your first um, <laughs> point that you'd like to bring up there, David? Well, I'm going to be a bit contrary and right off the bat because so many people will say you need to clear your desk because a cluttered desk is a cluttered mind. And I don't necessarily agree with that 100%. The thing that you need to think about in terms of clutter is, does it distract or motivate you? Obviously, if it's distracting you and it's causing you to think about things or it's prompting you to think about things that you shouldn't necessarily be thinking about while you're doing your work, then obviously it's not going to be very motivating to you. Meanwhile, maybe having that clutter in front of you represents something to you. It's like those piles of papers that you need to do your research, or maybe it represents work that's getting done, or maybe it represents work that you're thinking about working on, like your goals and your aspirations and your objectives and your bigger things that you're wanting to build towards and work towards. If that paper is there for a reason, then it should be there. But I think we all need to ask that question and think about whether clutter motivates us or it takes us further away from the work that we're trying to accomplish. So that's something that I wanted our listeners to think about up front. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I have heard that many times as well, right? That a cluttered desk is a cluttered mind. But there are people who function very well with a cluttered desk, you know, and they get more done. I've seen exactly. sales agents that are top sales agents and they have the messiest desk I've ever seen, right? So it may speak some volumes because uh, maybe they always keep in mind or keep in forefront of what needs to be done or what needs to be accomplished next. And they always have this constant reminder of, you know, if, if they can clean up this paper, that they'll always is, you know, they'll be able to accomplish what they need, but the next day they'll reclutter their desk because it's just more stuff that needs to be cleaned up maybe daily. And I wish I could remember which book this was, but I've read this illustration a couple times and it basically talked about, or it might have even been a podcast episode that I'd heard, but it basically goes on to describe, you know, there was this one guy that was making, you know, so much more money than anybody else in the company, but all he did all day was go out and have meetings with clients and go out golfing and have these fancy meals. And he's going, what are you doing that I don't know? Actually, I think it was the Art of Charm podcast. So it was one of the guys there that was talking about this. So you have to realize like high level activity isn't necessarily shuffling papers on your desk. Isn't this what like salespeople do often Mav is just instead of making the calls they're supposed to do, they just shuffle papers and look at their business cards and, and talk and go by the water cooler and talk to their colleagues and stuff like that. That, that can happen with in sales 100%, right? Those are sales agents that probably aren't experienced, maybe just don't have the know-how on what needs to be done, right? I know one of the things that uh, I challenged myself with was after listening to uh, Donald Kelly on the sales evangelist, one of the things he mentioned was, you know, do 10 sales calls before 10 o'clock. Awesome. So that was a, a great way for me to uh, try to do that, right? Now, it wasn't just 10 sales call. My goal became have 10 conversations by 10 o'clock. So try to get as much possible done right so why i can make 10 phone calls to 10 people and not get a hold of any of them and say hey look i accomplished so much today but and and that's what you're saying too right there's a lot of the times where you're just shuffling the paper thinking you're accomplishing a lot of things but in reality you're just kind of moving stuff from pile a to style pile mm. b and then looking at pile b the next day and say hey let's move it back to pile a and it looks like you got a lot more done And there's just too many prompts in today's world. We got emails, we got social media notifications, we got texts, phone calls, you know, we have team chat and project management systems. You add all of that together and you realize it's just a convenient way for other people to give tasks to you. So is that the number one thing? Is that the most high priority task to do? While those, some of those tasks may be urgent, may be important, they're probably more important to someone else. So you got to be thinking about what's a high priority activity for me, what's going to move me forward. Just depends on your job obviously like sales is one of those professions where you get to earn on your performance rather than just an hourly wage but if you're working on an hourly wage then it's i think it's still important to learn about that process of prioritization no you're right and that's that's part of it right so one of the things i actually questioned and asked myself was when i was working for all you know for the insurance company was working at the bank and selling homes my question to myself was well what do i need on my desk right i know everybody who's going to be asking this question of themselves is probably going to need something different right because like you said some people folk and focus and work well in clutter while other people don't right yes i, I know the question that uh, our listener here was asking was more to have people get organized so 
you know, and that's kind of the way I wanted to look at it too, right? I mean, if your clutter is your organization, then keep doing what you're doing, right? But if you find the clutter is taking you away from what you're looking to accomplish in a day, this is definitely, hopefully, one of the ways that we can, we can do it, right? And looking at what you actually need on your desk at the moment is mm-hmm. a great way to decide, right? I know one of the things I used to do um, was I would make sure my desk was clean because I just have a clean desk policy for myself. Uh, you know, like to say clear desk, clear mind, right? I really like that concept of it. So what I would do is all my work that I had to do for the day, uh, I would put on the right hand side. And as I was doing the work, you know, um, I would move it in front of me, then it's just now the one piece of paper is in front of me or the one file is in front of me, I would work on that file on the computer. As soon as I was done, I would move it to the left hand side, left hand side meant it was complete, yeah, complete meant it's time to file it or put it away or I could recycle it depending on what it was, right? And then I moved right back to the right-hand side, get the new piece of paper, put it in front of me and move it back to the left-hand side as soon as I was done that. So I had a three-step uh, three step system that really worked well for me, uh, keeping everything organized, keeping everything kind of moving in order, right? Now, not every time will that work because like you said, you have, you'll be bombarded by uh, you know, people's tasks, uh, emails, and all the time. But it was definitely a great way for me to figure out what I needed on my desk and what I didn't, right? Absolutely. I mean, don't, and don't worry, Mav, I will get into some tips, but I just wanted to start people thinking about whether that clutter does anything for them. Does it help them or does it not? So that's why I wanted to talk about that. Right, absolutely. And and that's part of it too, right? I think talking about the clutter is and also deciding what you don't need on your desk, right? So if again you're finding that it's tough to function in the clutter, then decide what don't you need on your desk, right? Or how yeah, can exactly. you maybe keep everything that you have on your desk but maybe put it in a little bit more of a, a organized fashion. Exactly. One thing that I think a lot of people don't do, and I'm I don't even know if it was in my original notes or not, but I wanted to mention it real quick was just making notes about everything or reviewing the work that you have coming up the night before. This is something I did recently where on Sunday, I wasn't necessarily doing a ton of writing, although I did end up doing some of it. What I did was I started outlining my posts in advance so that the next day I could get them done quicker. And what I did, you know, with writing blog posts, oftentimes you're just thinking about the title, the headings. And in some cases, all I did was just look for links or relevant sources that talked about that thing that I was going to be researching and talking about and just throwing those into the post so I'd be able to click on them when I was ready to write about them. So thinking about the work the night before will also prompt you to think about, okay, like in terms of writing anyway, I can speak from experience that it caused me to think about examples that I could bring up in the post that I was going to be writing the next day. So that's why I think it's great. But no matter what your profession is, reviewing the work the night before will get your mind in motion thinking about what you need to do the following day to make it better and more efficient. I like that idea of of reviewing it the night before. But what I would also recommend is maybe take the, the five minutes before you leave work and organize yourself. So you don't necessarily have to go home and uh, organize your thoughts on what you need to do. Take the last five, 10 minutes, organize what you want to do for the next day at your, you know, at your desk. And then in the morning when you come in, now you have a list of things that you know that need to get done. Yeah, sure. You've had more emails come in, new things are being added on, but that's when prioritizing what is the most important uh, will also come in place, right? So again, if you're in a work situation, absolutely, that could be great. If you're in a writing situation, like we do, sometimes we'll write posts as well. And it's really, is framing on kind of what you want that post to look like having a system so that post you know maybe has a something that looks the exact same every single time so you have the right links you always need in there has the right headers got the right pictures uh, knowing where to go to get all that thing right just having a system in place to understand how that works right so same thing if you're at work you know have a system before you leave or when you come to work spend maybe five minutes or ten minutes get there a little early because you know that's what you know that's what you're supposed to do be there a little early so right at nine o'clock or eight o'clock whatever time you start you can start moving right forward on what needs to get done for the day make those phone calls especially if you're in sales right you don't want to spend you know the first 30 minutes or 45 minutes of your work day especially if you're in sales uh getting your day organized you want to be hitting those phones you want to call in clients you want to you know find ways to create income not find ways to shuffle paper like you were saying 
And that's actually a really great way to create some boundaries between your work life and your personal life too. So I like that, Mav. It's a great suggestion. Yeah, for sure. You know, I think it's just little things, right? I mean, if you're able to go home, a lot of times, I think you're right. We do take our work home, especially if you're working at office or, you know, especially if you're working your own home business, right? It's easy to go back to your office and just start working some more, right? There's people that go, come home for a little bit, then they head right back to the office, especially if you're an accountant in, in uh, February, March, or April, you're going to be doing a lot of time where you might be going home and head right back and working on taxes and trying to understand and, you know, manipulate numbers for people and see if you can get the more money back or whatever. But those are things that, you know, you'll, you'll have to do, I think, to stay organized. And I think the way, the reason that I expressed it the way I did is because I don't necessarily have separation between work and private life that much. So that's probably why I said it the way I did. But reviewing at the end of day, that should be, probably be the best way to put it. Yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong with reviewing it before you go to bed either, right? No, it's a good way to to get your thoughts out. So you're not trying to sleep and then you have a hundred thoughts in your mind while you close your eyes, right? So getting everything off your mind before you go to bed is not a bad idea either. So writing down whatever your thoughts are before you go to sleep for work, I think that's wonderful too. So both ways work. Just finding the right way that works for your organizational skills, find that and do that. No question. The next thing that I wanted to share about was just getting things out of your head because your head isn't really a great storage organization system. We often talk about how the male brain has compartments, but you know, pulling those compartments up on command can be pretty tough. Plus, we just re- we forget things. Like You've had those great ideas and then you forgot what they were like minutes later because you didn't write it down or you didn't take an audio memo or just you leverage the technology that you have and send a voicemail to yourself and say, Hey, this idea, remember that, <laughs> you know, you, there's many ways to do it, but we forget things so often. So putting it all onto paper is something that David Allen suggests as well. You can also put it into a project management system. If that's more your style, I've used Asana now for a little while and I put all my high priority tasks in there. That's also a good way to review and make me think about, oh yeah, I mean, I might have my daily to-do list as far as things that are urgent and things that I need to complete for my clients, which is, don't get me wrong, important. But what is the high level stuff? That's like business development, that's marketing. Those are the things that excite me, content creation, those are the things that I really want to be doing, whether it's producing assets in the form of like music or eBooks or actual physical books or courses or things like that, that can be used and reused and sold over and over and over again, as long as they're relevant. Right on. And you know, I've, I've tried to keep it super simple and same things like you're saying, right? You I mean, there's tons of different programs we can use to stay organized. I, you know, I still use the old fashioned word, right? I, I put all my stuff in there that I need to, hmm. to do on a daily basis. So I just kind of made myself like a, even on like um, a spreadsheet, right? So I just made myself a spreadsheet saying this is what I need to do on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, all the way to Sunday and start again the new week. So that at least prioritizes what I need to do on a daily basis. And then on the actual Word document, uh, not the spreadsheet itself, I will actually put other things that I also would like to accomplish and I'll break it down by what month that it makes sense for me to do that work, right? So really understanding what needs to be done and and the timely fashion that needs to be done is super important as well, right? Uh, I'll also send myself uh, email reminders. So, you know, Mm. when I was working at uh, the insurance company and as when I was selling cars and stuff, I would actually put, call this client to say thank you for purchasing a vehicle one month ago and I put it one month ahead to let them know, you know, to make that phone call so I'll just pop up on my computer screen and say, hey, you know what? If I'm not doing anything this exact second, I'll quickly make a quick sales phone call and just say thank you to the person and maybe ask for a referral, right? So just all these little reminders that would pop up and let me know saying, you know, and again, these are all little simple things just while I'm working, right? So um, a little bit different if you're if you're creating a website and creating a business online, uh, I've noticed that there's a lot of tools that you can use and you have to really understand which tools are going to help you uh, accomplish the work you're looking to do as well as stay organized as you're doing all that. Very true. And that's very smart. You can also use something like a desk calendar. I've gotten into the habit of using one for, I think, close to three years now. And in 20, I think it was towards the end of 2014 
or so, or maybe 2015 that I bought one. So even though there was only a couple months left, I still bought the calendar and started using it and it was great. So I just kept doing it for the last couple of years. Yeah, that's a great idea too. The desk calendar is massive, right? And I know a lot of people who are listening, if they do have a, a nine to five job, they typically do have a calendar on their desk. If, if it's maybe pinned to their cubicle, maybe it's right on their uh, desk itself or it's right on their computer, right? So use it, utilize it. I think it's a beautiful tool that you can use to really see what needs to be done today as well as what the next, you know, next the week looks like or this week looks like and what the rest of your month looks like right and you can start jotting putting stuff in there keeping things organized because a lot of times what happens is if you don't know what's going on you sometimes will overlap stuff right overlap duties overlap presentations maybe you'll take on more work than you should have because you know you had a gig somewhere and then now you got to write six blog posts at the same time so it really can add up and really start making things tough if you really don't understand what your day looks like Yes, that's exactly right. You want to see what's coming up on your calendar and keep a bird's eye view of it, especially when you're doing freelancing or entrepreneurial work because you just never know all the things that you might forget about things that are on your schedule and you don't really want that to happen. So. No, you're right. And, and, you know, kind of going along with that, too, I find, especially if you work in an office or you have, even if you have a home office, one of the things you can do is uh, organize your files in a, in a filing cabinet, right? If, if you work in a cubicle, most of the time there's a filing cabinet there or you have the overhead drawers that you can put your files in, right? So you don't necessarily have to keep them in your desk. You can keep them next to you so you can always grab them when you need them, right? I know mm. a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I need them all the time. So no problem. At the, in the morning when you're taking that five minutes to prepare or 10 minutes to prepare your day, pull those files out that you know you need because you've made a list already that's going to tell you, hey, this is what I'm going to need to do today. So just grab all the work that's needed. And as the day goes, you can start taking stuff from your right-hand side or your left-hand side, whatever way you prefer, and start moving it to the opposite side. And as you're getting stuff done, you can start filing things and putting stuff away if if you need to put it away. Yeah. And you can also do like bulk tasking. So instead of like if you're filing things away into certain folders, you don't have to do it then and there because you might be on a roll as far as getting some things done or some accounts done or data entry or whatever it is that you're doing. And then maybe at the end of the day, or you could even say just once a week, you dedicate an hour to just filing things away. And that way you're, you're bulk tasking and getting things done and you're not constantly task switching which can kill your productive productivity yeah for sure and i've heard all the time that it takes you know about 15 to 20 minutes to get into a rhythm uh especially when you're doing some creative work and like thinking on, on problem solving on on uh, writing on blogging on even just working in an in a office environment right there's a lot of already noise typically around you the phones are going off so it can already be hard sometimes to get into that work uh space and in that work groove and if you're continually getting up to and never really getting into a work group, it can be a very tough thing where you look like you're getting a lot of stuff done, like you said earlier, but really all you've been doing is shuffling paper, yeah. you know, for most of the day. And I know from most people have told me, and even from my own uh, experience that, you know, you go to a work for a three hour, you know, sorry, you work for eight hours, you probably only really done three hours worth of work. That's right. You've tried to make yourself look busy for the most of the other time, right? Uh, I know a lot of people like that. I've heard that too, Matt. Those are some really great points. I think another thing that people maybe don't think about enough is just making to-do lists. So even though it might seem like really obvious, you always, or a lot of people make lists before they go to the grocery store. Or the example that Brian Tracy often gives is you make a list before you go on vacation because you don't want to forget anything. And those are the things that you need to get done before you head out on your vacation. And you also accomplish 80% of what you get done on your to-do list always. I've found that to be the case and Brian Tracy says that. So if you're the kind of person that's productive and you can stick to your schedule and get things done, odds are you are going to complete 80% of those tasks and don't be disturbed by the 20% because maybe they probably aren't as important as you think they are in the first place. I make to-do lists weekly. You might choose to do them daily. You might choose to do them monthly depending on the volume of the work that you're doing i've had to adapt that too i used to do it on just three by five or i think it was four by six index cards and i ran out of space so i had to move on over to a yellow legal pad which is now used to be taking up about half a page to three quarters of page and is now almost taking up the full page in terms of my weekly to-do list so there's a crazy amount of work there for me to do but either way that's another bird's eye view method of seeing what it is you need to do is it boring yeah but still checking things off and scratching things off is you know it feels good 
Right. And I do like the idea of writing everything down because that's exactly how I operate as well, right? So mm-hmm. I think maybe not everybody works that way for sure. Some people no. say, you know what, I got it. It's in my mind. I'll, I'll be able to, I won't forget. I'll be able to remember. And, you know, that's great. That That's a great way to have a mental exercise of being able to remember things. And, and uh, that's one wonderful way. But I mean, in order for you to really... Um, be able to accomplish whatever's in your mind effectively. I think once you write it on paper, then you allow your mind to focus on how to complete the task or find different yeah. ways to complete the task or solve the problem. Because instead of trying it, to remember it. Exactly. So instead of trying to remember the problem, now the problem's on a piece of paper. Now your mind can focus on how to solve the problem because it's hard for your mind, from what I understand, to do both at the same time. You can't just put the problem there and then also try to solve the problem while your mind's still thinking about the problem the whole time. So yeah, you know, for those who have never tried a list try it for, for people who've who do use lists you know talk to those people and say hey you know why do you use a list and what are you getting from using this list right because don't just use our words and our experience definitely look at your colleagues that you work with and say hey you know how does a list help you and really find out how they're effectively using that list as well and some other things that you can do with lists you could create a separate not to do list that's something that many people don't think about but after a point you know, you've experienced a certain number of successes and failures in your job or your business. And you've come to the point of realizing that certain activities aren't ones that maybe you should be handling and someone else should be handling, or maybe they don't matter at all, or maybe they can be automated, or maybe they can be delegated. So there's always alternatives to those kinds of tasks. But through experience, you've learned, I just shouldn't do those anymore. So having a not do list could also be beneficial a reminder just letting you know oh yeah i really shouldn't be engaging in this because it's not benefiting me another thing that i just mentioned earlier but i've started creating a high priority list so again thinking about business development and not just about getting stuck in the business but working on the business in my case and you might want to do the same having a separate high priority list that you can review those tasks may not be urgent but they are really important Right on. And and that's a wonderful way to look at it too, right? Because there's things that you know you should be doing. There's things that you know you should not be doing. And I think that's where personal development comes in place as well, right? Because um, it's not just always about looking at what you can accomplish at work, but you also have to look within yourself and say, you know, what do I need to change about myself so I can be more organized? Because sometimes it's not the fact that your desk is messy. It's it's maybe your, the process you've been doing for 10 years, 20 years, and it's just become a system that you've, you've developed. And it's not something you want to develop, but just over time, that's how it is, or you've seen somebody else that way, or maybe that's how you got trained to do it, right? So I think when you start developing the right systems and maybe reading the right, reading some books on teaching you on how to be more uh, organized, right? Even yeah. you, typically, you'll see the people who have maybe messy homes may also maybe have a messy uh, desk at, as well, right? So I think it's just finding. You know, that's why I do like the idea of clearing the clutter myself, right? Because I do think there's a reflection of what's going on in your mind, your home, and your desk space. They all kind of relate. Also, in relationships too, right? So if those area, if your desk is not organized, sometimes your relationships are not organized either. So I think looking at personal development and making that a priority on one of the things on your list as well is huge. I know one of the things me and yourself, David, do Mm -hmm. is we consume a lot of uh, podcasts. We look at read different blogs. You know, we're we're writing quite a bit for ourselves to put out for our readers on our various websites here um, you know we find ways to stay organized but it, that's the only way we can do it because we know with all the stuff that I'm looking at I know you have on your paper in front of you uh, you, you have maybe about uh, I don't know if I had to guess but close to about 40 things on that list and <laughs> in order to stay organized for the week you have to really be able to prioritize what makes sense what needs to be done today what needs to be done yes. tomorrow and what what doesn't need to be done to the end of the week because why would you focus on end of the week stuff on Monday when you know you can maybe focus it towards on Thursday depending on again how uh, how much work you may need to put into it that's why deadlines are great so if you don't have deadlines in your workplace one thing that can motivate you is putting your own deadlines in place and also just thinking about what is the consequence of not accomplishing it today will you be chewed out by a manager or will it hurt your own self-esteem and I think the latter is really bigger who cares about (laughs) I mean you're still within a system and you're trying to do the best you can in your job if you care about it and you're passionate about it but you know, getting chewed out by a manager isn't as big of a deal as your own hurt ego. 
Right, absolutely. You know, one of the things I did want to bring up here was something a little different, hopefully, on the way of thinking. I know if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business owner, even if you're an employee, it doesn't really matter. I think you can definitely, uh, you know, review the workspace of the coworkers or other managers you work with, right? So, for example, if you're an entrepreneur like David and myself and you're and you're working from home, I can come over to David's place. I can take a look at, you know, how does he work? I can, you know, uh, meet other entrepreneurs and see how they work in their workspace. You know, mm-hmm. if I'm at work and I'm a manager, I can see how other managers' workspace looks, you know, how they organize it. And I can, if I'm an employee, I can walk up to any employee's desk in the office and really take a look at who's got the best um, workspace based on the way I work, right? And you can easily figure that out because, you know, typically the people who are the highest, for example, in sales, you know, you can take, and if you want to emulate and have the highest sales yourself, look at what the people are doing that have the highest sales. How do they set up their day? How do they set up their workspace? You know, do they have photos on the walls or of their cubicle or you know uh, or do they have no photos like why maybe find out and ask those questions hey how come you don't post this how come you don't have a calendar on your desk or why do you have a calendar on your desk how do you use that calendar because it's on your desk right and really pick the brain of the person and find out how much time they're wasting and how much time they're actually utilizing in the day that's something brian Tracy talks about with the psychology of sales he at one point finally decided to go and talk to a coworker and find out why they were so successful in sales and why he wasn't doing as well. And the first thing he got asked was show me your sales presentation. And Brian had no idea what a sales presentation was. So he said, you know, show me yours and I'll show you mine. And then he was gracious enough that he began to walk Brian through that process of what a sales presentation meant and what it looked like. So those are the kinds of things that we often don't do or we forget to do is just talking to people within maybe even within our workplace like so often you could if you want to if you care about religion and spirituality you could invite your pastor out to your home and have dinner with them or invite them out to coffee and talk to them you can do that with anybody somebody who's great at investing would you like to learn more about investing why not take them out to lunch it's really the same thing at work who's high performing who's doing well talk to them ask them questions see what they're doing that's different from you Exactly right. You gotta, you gotta do what the people who are success, successful that are do, are do what they're doing. I think that's the best way to uh, yeah. say it. Sorry, um, but you know, if you want the results of somebody who's organized, then find the people who are organized because typically the people who are organized are the people who are typically moving up that ladder as well. Not only in their business, but also as uh, you know at work as well, right? So I mean, they're very parallel. I think what you, how you look at your life at work is the same way you can look at your life after work in your. In, on your on-site business as well, right? So you will, you know, if you got a messy desk at work, and I say messy in a way not cluttered, but messy where you don't know what's going on, uh, your your work desk and your workspace when you're trying to be an on on-site entrepreneur here will probably reflect and be the exact same, right? You'll you know it'll take you longer, which is not what you want because it'll cost you more money. You don't want that either, mm-hmm. and it'll cost you more time. And who wants to spend time and more money trying to accomplish what they could accomplish in a lot less time? It's about being valuable, right? I'll resist the temptation to do my Jim Rohn impression now, but what, you know, which employee would be more valuable to me? Somebody who simply does their work and does what's expected, which is still good versus somebody that actually takes the time to understand the business and goes ahead and does things and finds solutions for me when I may not have the time or energy to think about it. Instead of asking me what solution they should be using, they go out and find their own solutions to their problems. Well, definitely the latter, especially if you know there's the margin within my business to be able to pay for additional tools, additional training, or whatever else is needed, whatever resources they need to take their work to the next level. It's, it's amazing to me that they even be thinking about that as an employee. So that will take you to a new level of value instantly. Right. So maybe let's uh, look at something uh, slightly different. Let's say you're a new employee at, uh, um, say, a job, for example. So what are some of the steps that you think you could take, based on what we've talked about now, to develop a plan to be a more effective and more organized uh, employee for your, for your company? If the company has training, then take it. If all they have is a really boring operational manual, although in some cases we certainly still need to go through that, 
it's a, it's about asking those questions. Why are we doing things the way we are? Is this the most efficient way, right? We talked about asking questions, but first of all, you need to get acquainted with your surroundings and that may take a certain amount of time for many people to feel comfortable in a role. It probably takes about three to six months. That's where we all start. That's where you need to start too. But then you need to begin asking those questions is because now you've done the work for a little while. So you've seen the inefficiencies, you've seen the problems, you've seen the challenges, you've seen what's taking you more time rather than less time. And if there's anything where you're saying to yourself, gosh, I think there could be a better way of doing this, then you really need to be posing that questions to the manager or the executives or the owner or whoever that you're talking to or reporting to. You need to begin to bring some of those questions to them, even in meetings or wherever else. And that will... to to certainly take you to the next level because now they understand you have a vested interest in your role and doing your role well and you want to do it better than you're already doing it right so what do you what do you think about people uh and their workspace so let's in the way what i mean by that is you know you come into the company you're new you kind of look around and you see you know there's some people who are neat and tidy you see some people who are you know kind of all over the place on their desk um you know how do you know which one you should kind of um you know model your desk after you don't necessarily So if you're in sales, you could certainly monitor the results. I know that some companies post things right up on their whiteboard or, or, you know, community board or whatever it is for everyone to see how many sales a certain person has gotten or the total revenue generated from that person. If that person's desk is not cluttered, then maybe that's something to emulate. If it is cluttered, then you need to think about what high priority tasks they are putting ahead of cleaning up their desk. Right. Now, maybe it's a little bit slightly different question. Now that you've got on your computer, you, you know, you started it, you've turned it on. And what do you think or how do you feel that you can utilize your hard drive to organize your files? This is something a lot of people don't do very well, is keeping their desktop and their download folder and all those other things completely organized and clean. I think it's a tough thing for me to do at times, too, although it was part of my weekly review process, something I'll talk more about a little bit later. I think having folders, it's just really basic having fold folders labeled by client. So I'm right for a company called ghost blog writers. There's many different clients in different industries and different categories that, that I work for. So each one is labeled within that folder. Every client is labeled and I'll just slot all the blog posts and images and all the other assets into those so I can stay organized that way. I mean, that's a very basic and simple way to do it, but maybe people aren't thinking about that. So it's something to, to look at. Right. Now, what do you uh, what do you think about the people who or what would you, I guess, suggest not think about? But what would you suggest to the people who, you know, say I have, you know, my main icons on my computer screen and then they have a bunch of other uh, icons and files that they say, you know, I really need these icons every single day. So they keep them on their on their um, on their screen of their computer. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's just learning about the computer resources available to you. So you can use your desktop as a system for clicking on programs and opening them, but your computer probably also has something along the bottom, like a menu. So using the fast click menu, because that's one click versus two clicks, I know that sounds like a small difference, but it can make a difference. It can add up using those fast clicks or storing things in folders by category as well. So you could just create a folder and say, hey, this one is for accounting programs that I use every single day. This folder is for spreadsheets I use every single day. And now at least it's a little more organized than having, you know, 50, 60, 100 icons all over, spread all over your desktop, which, yeah, you might use every day, but then you're also looking for them and trying to find them every day. And God forbid someone, you know, hit right click and, and reorganize <laughs> all your icons and now they're out of order, right? Like, I know people have gotten upset with me over that. I was like, oh, sorry, like, I didn't know you had it the way you wanted it. And then they're like, yeah, the, the mess is the way we want it. And I'm like, okay, fine. Use your mess. Right. <laughs> it's funny, right? And that's, but that's how some people operate the best, right? They operate in what their comfort zones are with yes. whatever their surroundings are, right? So uh, what do you think about um, or staying organized and phone calls? Incoming so, and outbound, I guess. There's some different ways to handle it. If your job absolutely requires you to be answering those phone calls the moment they come in, 
then please do process them when they come in. There's just no other way around it. But I would say most jobs, again, it's just like email. All that is, is a inbound call that's going to add to your to-do list without, you know, your own permission, or should I say, you know, your own agenda. So when that phone call comes in, the other decision that you can make is to put it off. You can just like you would process maybe your folders or your files once a week or twice a week and you would set aside the time to bulk task it you could bulk task your voicemail and get back to everybody that that needs your help and if your boss doesn't like that then obviously change the way that you do things but otherwise i would suggest letting that go to letting that go to voicemail when you can Right. And I do love that idea because even when I was an underwriter for an insurance company, uh, you know, there was a four hour um, leeway we had. So anytime mm-hmm. someone calls, we got to call them back within four hours. So I just pretty much what I did was I looked at my day. I said, well, I start at nine and I'm done at five. So what's four hours? So from nine o'clock is to one o'clock. So I can answer any calls between nine and one at, at uh, one o'clock and then I had to answer between one and five so I can answer them at 4 30 so I finished my day by answering all the phone calls that came in I didn't pick up the phone as they came in because I knew you know the underwriters are pretty much um, looking to see if we can cover those risks right though some of those risks are not something that need to be covered right away it's just questions that their clients have had right so as long as I'm getting back to them within my four hours I could say like you said, you know, bulk tasks. So I would check all my voicemails. I would then call everybody back all at the exact same time. So I would utilize my time and say, you know, I'm not going to be able to pick up the phone, answer, and then go back to it because I got to jump out of files, go back into a new file, you know, and maybe I have to go do some research because if they leave me the voicemail saying, hey, you know, this is kind of what we're looking for. Before I call them, I can do the research, have the answer ready uh, based on what they've told me. Right now, if I, of course, I need to do a little bit more digging for them. Hey, no problem. But typically with the knowledge, I could go back and say, you know what, based on the research you did, plus the questions, additional questions you're asking me, it's a definitive yes or no or whatnot, right? So I uh, definitely utilize the, the rules that your company has for for phone calls, I think is a huge way to stay organized. Mm -hmm. If you work at a call center, obviously it's going to be very tough to do that. You're going to definitely be picking up phone calls the whole time. That's your job. That's your job, right? But if if in sales, for example, we know you you got to call the customer back, but you don't necessarily have to call the customer back instantaneously uh, unless that's something that you've discussed with the customer that when they call, these are things that you're going to be picking up. It depends also where you are in the sales cycle as well, right? So, I mean, it's all going to depend on your work habits, the way you can find the most efficient way. I don't think uh, answering phone Phone calls right away and calling people right away is obviously going to be the most efficient. So especially if you're like making a phone call, you know, you're in a good, you got good sales call, you've made two or three really good ones, you've set some, you know, um, dates for the future to schedule and meet everybody. And then you got to make a call and that goes negative, then you got to go back to try to make positive phone calls for sales, it can be very tough on your mindset, right? So really find the right time to make those calls. Those are really great examples, Mav. I like that. Thank you. And even Tim Ferriss talks about like planned avoidance. He talks about this idea that even if he ignores email for a day or for a week, typically there's no major colossal disasters that have happened. Again, you know, you want to have some discretion about when to do that and when not to do that and emails that you're expecting and need to answer from your boss and things like that. But I would say that plan avoidance can work pretty well if you're in that situation where you're really in the zone and you're trying to focus on on something that you're doing. Even with writing, Mav, I'm sure you get it. It's like just turn your phone off so you're not getting constant notifications. Stay in the zone. Keep writing. Same thing with work. If you're at work and you're doing data entry and you're really in the flow and you're you're getting going with with your work, then why why stop? Why let interruptions you know stop you from what you're doing unless you absolutely Absolutely have to so absolutely and even the book that you're talking about Tim Ferriss's uh, four hour work week uh, one of the things he says is that he leaves on his voicemail saying look I'll call you at this specific time and this specific time and that's it so leave me a message and you'll hear back from me by this time so and he's pretty much telling him leave me a message I'm not picking up the phone if it's urgent email me or call me or text me or whatever his message says so the people you know will do that they'll review their message well is this really urgent sure it is okay let me call them if it's not urgent 
urgent. They say, you know, what? I can leave him a message or I'll send him an email. He'll get to it in a couple of days as he promised. So, you know, it really depends. And you have to develop the system that you want. And then you really have to teach it to people to use the system you want. Right. So he had to teach people, hey, 1230 is the only time I'm going to call you back. So leave me a message. And that's what he was doing. He was teaching them. I'm not going to call you before that. If he broke his system and called somebody at 10 o'clock, it had to be for something that was probably super relevant, super set time sensitive. Other than that, he probably wouldn't break his own system. That's right. And that's some, uh, that's a really good way to put some additional checks and balances in place to make sure people know what your rules are and what to expect from you. I would say another thing, this is from directly from David Allen's book, but if something will only take you five to 10 minutes, so these are probably low, they might even be high level tasks, but oftentimes low level tasks, things that are, have maybe some urgency to them, but are really easy to complete. When you're going through your list of tasks that you need to do or your to-do lists, if it will only take five to 10 minutes, then just do it now instead of putting it off. If something will take longer, then create a page for it, write it down, get it off your mind, but come back to it later. And that's a pretty good rule. I think David Allen's rule is actually two minutes, but I, I, I'd say be generous with yourself a little bit. If there's something that you can do quickly, why not get it done and then it's off your list? You don't have to think about it anymore. Yeah, no, I love that idea. It, it, it makes sense, right? I mean, why keep things in your mind? We kind of mentioned that earlier. If you can get this stuff done within two to five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, then do it, right? You can get six, seven projects or seven, six little things off your list within one hour, right? Yeah. Or you can get one thing off your list in one hour, maybe two hours. So you you really have to decide also what time of the day it makes sense to do those small tasks. Right? Does it make mm-hmm. sense at the first time, you know, when you get to work or does it make sense towards the end of your day? You know, you have to really look at maybe the time zones that you work in and the other time zones that you also work with, right? So if you live in the West and you work with the East, you probably want to get to your job and start calling people right away. So when they close, you still might have an hour or two hours of work left. And that's when you're starting to do those little bit of those less time sensitive, less time uh, taking activities. That's right. And I think we even had that conversation the other day. Like some people will say writing is a late night activity. Just depends on the person. For me, I try to get my writing done during the day when I still have creative energies. People say they're fresh first thing in the morning. I don't necessarily, I mean, I'm feeling better these days, but I don't necessarily feel super fresh and awake first thing in the morning, but give it a half hour or so. And I can probably dive into that, to that project. So it's really, you're right. It's just thinking about when is the good time to do it? When is the right time to do it might be another question that you can ask too, especially if you're working in that nine to five time frame. that's your work. Everybody's out of the office by five. Everybody comes in at nine. If that's the life that you live, then I think it is absolutely essential to think about when is this going to be done? Right. And one of the things that uh, while you're speaking actually made me wonder and think about was, I guess, why do you want to organize your desk and workspace? You know, why do you feel you need to, right? Is it the results you're get, not getting or getting? Are you looking to increase your results? Uh, let's say you had, you know, 100,000 in sales. Are you looking now to get 150,000 in sales? So is that why you feel you need to, you know, maybe revamp your desk area? Uh, so if you really have an understanding of why you need to uh, or reorganize it, I think it'll give you an, a, not only a goal, but it'll also give you a better understanding of what else can be accomplished if you, if you were to do it. But if you don't even have an understanding of why you're going to do it, you may not even organize your desk, right? Or you might go back to your old habits because that's typically what we see a lot of the times too. People will organize, they get super excited, they'll, they'll make these lists. And then what happens is a couple days after, or maybe a week after, they'll kind of, you know, maybe oh, I won't put it on my list. I'll remember this time. Or, and they'll stop doing the things that were making them successful. So yeah. I think having a reason and understanding that is going to be huge. Well, fear is such a big motivating factor for a lot of people. I think they're just afraid that something will fall through the clack, the cracks and the boss won't like it, or maybe that will result in less pay for them. So those kind of motivators also certainly exist. It's good to be aware of them because I'm not saying that they're completely negative. Sometimes fear will motivate you to dig your, dig your well before you're thirsty, so to speak. Get things in order before you find yourself in need of them. Right. So what else you got going on there on your list there, David? I wanted to talk about creating a weekly review process for yourself. I used to have one that I used. I don't use it anymore. I am working on a new one that I'm thinking about doing on Food Fridays during that six-hour gap that I'm kind of taking to recharge and sharpen the saw, so to speak. 
but I originally got the idea from Michael Hyatt. He has a weekly process that he does, and I think it's a great to take an example from that. And I did. I, I kind of took that and adapted to, adapted it to my own needs. So his process is an eight-step process, and there, the blog post is called The Importance of the Weekly Review. If you search that up, you can probably find it. So number one is to just gather all loose papers and the de- on the desk and process them. I think that's a great thing to do. You know, especially when it comes to like mail. So you just need to put it, file away anything that you've received in the mail, like bills or invoices or anything that's no longer relevant and you don't need in front of you anymore. Number two is to process notes. Now, granted, a lot of people don't take notes anymore, but I would encourage you to take notes, especially in, in meetings. If you're trying to stay organized and you're trying to do things that will help the company move forward and you care about getting things done on time for your boss and all that kind of stuff, then taking time to take the notes and then have a weekly review process to review them is good. One of the things I found with taking notes is, you know, there's always somebody else going to be taking notes. So it's it's probably more efficient if you spend your time listening and understanding, asking good questions, because, you know, and this is just maybe from the companies I worked at, somebody else was always taking notes. I can always borrow their notes and be like, hey, let me review what you wrote down. Or what they would do is they would have a manager or somebody or a supervisor who would then just email you a copy of the, mm-hmm. of the agenda for the day too, right? So I find that I, I, that's not a bad idea, process, you know, taking notes and then understanding what to do with it. Definitely, if, you, if there's something that's said that you find you can take instantaneously and put that into your system right away, definitely write it down and find a way. But if you can find most of your t- uh, time during the meeting not t- taking notes, because somebody else will be doing it anyways. It's a great tip. Number three is to review the last week on your calendar. It's always good to take a quick look back at what you've accomplished and what you've done. Some people forget to pat themselves on the back for the work that they've done. Some people take too much leeway with praising themselves and celebrating constantly. But either way, just take some time to look at what you did on your calendar. And that might actually tell you what you need to do next as well. So there's lots of value there. Right. I do like that because one of the things you probably notice too is sometimes you'll do this stuff on your calendar just to get it off your list. Yeah. But sometimes if you go back to that list and say, you know, okay, what did I do? And you'll probably be honest with yourself and say, you know what, I probably didn't do that to the best of my capabilities. Maybe I'm going to revisit that one item and try to do it better, right? So it's a great way to go back and maybe, you know, at things that you didn't give yourself a full chance at, to redo the work and maybe give it that 100% versus that maybe 50 or 80%. That's great. And number four, he says he reviews his annual goals. Again, something that a lot of people don't do is to write down their goals and then review them regularly. And just the strength of that, right? You're submitting it to your mind. And as your subconscious begins to accept it, then you begin to take action on it, perhaps even in ways that you don't recognize with for yourself. So I could see the value in that activity for sure. Do you think um, the goals you know, need to be re- uh, reviewed annually? No, he's saying this is part of his weekly process. So he's Sorry. reviewing his annual goals. Right, that's what I'm going to say. Do you think they need to be reviewed weekly, his annual goals? I don't know that they need to be or not. But keeping them out in front of you is important. Hmm. So what what are some ways that the people can keep their goals out in front of them? You can write them down on a whiteboard, as I have, and split them up into quarterly goals. And also not set too many because you could easily overwhelm yourself with too many goals. Obviously, goals that motivate you probably aren't in your immediate comfort zone, but perhaps just outside of it. So you want to make sure that you have goals that matter to you as well. Right. So if, if you're in sales, one of the best things to do is uh, review where you are weekly uh, on accomplishing your annual goal or your monthly goal. Um, so understand where your matrix is or your metrics is so you can actually accomplish that goal and understand what's in your sales funnel, understand where everybody is in the process of uh, buying and uh, maybe not buying from you as well. Or maybe they're two months out, maybe they're three years out before they buy because they're still on a contract. So understanding where you are and how many more new clients you may have to get or how many more blog posts you might have to write or how many more uh, you know interviews you might need to do uh, before you start your company understand where you are so then you can always you know where where to begin every day as well yeah and for some people it might just be more a matter of reviewing their to-do list on a weekly basis and that'll give them a sense of where they're headed and the tasks that they need to do and maybe your to-do list is your goal list or at least it corresponds pretty closely so that could work just as well i think 
Number five in the process is review the next week on the calendar. So you need to look at what's coming up. Make sure you're aware of everything that you have to do, whether it's personal appointments or business appointments, just having them all in there. You'll know exactly what you need to do when the time comes up. Right. And just prioritize what needs to be done first and yeah. what can wait, right? Because a lot of times the things that you're also doing to be organized and stay organized in your calendar are things that might be uh, delegatable to other people, right? So you might be able to give that to somebody else and say, hey, man, can you take care of this for me while I, I'm going to go work on this stuff and then collaborate with people and to get the work done, not just you doing all the work 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. So maybe something to think about. Number six is to review your project lists. This could be the same as your to-do list potentially, so it could easily go into the same category. Maybe in my case, like I gave the example earlier of reviewing what I'm doing in Asana, that's high value to me. That might be another thing that you could do, but whatever it is, you know, you could take that time to look at the projects, the progress you made, the next steps, who you're waiting on is another important thing. It's like somebody else has a something to do with the project that they need to complete that you've requested they complete and haven't yet. Okay. So what's a reasonable amount of time to follow up with them? Maybe following up with them in the next three days would be wise. And that way, you know, the status of where they are on on that project. So when you're waiting on others, that might be another thing to think about there. Yeah, I love that. That's you said it perfectly. And that's why the reason I used to set a set a calendar reminders was for that exact reason, right? So I haven't gotten information I was requiring, I put in a calendar two or three days out, and it pop up say, Hey, I still haven't, you know, have I heard from this person yet? No, okay, send out another email, try to figure out what's stopping them. If they're, they may have something that's stopping them on their back end, maybe somebody else hasn't given them the information to give to you, right? So sometimes maybe in your project list, you can say, you know, what, instead of talking to the person that you're speaking to, maybe you can go right to the source and get that information directly for them, right? So finding ways to, you know, take things off your project list as well and and understand how to get that done more effectively is might be a great idea. And that just happens to be number seven. So I I jumped ahead, but yeah, (laughs) review, review delegated items. So, so there you go. Anything that you're getting other people to do or anything that's on their task list that you've given them or your indirect communication with them, that's, that would be the thing to do. And I love your example too, Mav. And then number eight is just review someday maybe list. This might sound foreign or different for, to a lot of people. So a quick explanation. David Allen talks about it in his book, Getting Things Done as well. Your someday maybe list is things you're thinking you would like to do one day or when you have enough money or when you meet a certain circumstances. These aren't things that, you know, you're, this is not your bucket list per se, because your bucket list in theory is something that you absolutely must complete before this life is over. These are the things that I absolutely want to get done before I'm done. This is more so like, you know, one day I would like to go scuba diving or one day I would like to go skydiving. Things that maybe you want to experience or have thought about doing, but aren't necessarily making it a huge priority in your life right now. So that's the fun thing to do for people just on a dream building level, I think. Right. No, I love that idea. To, I think that it, is, it does take a little bit of time to even look at what you have on your list sometimes and really decide, is it still important to you totally. a year from now, right? So reviewing it uh, every so often makes sense because I know I have a to-do list. It's probably about six to eight pages long of things I'd love to do in my life. Uh, it's my bucket list per se. Uh, but on there is stuff like having businesses with certain people. Well, the funny thing is I've actually never talked to these people about having a business with them. Mm. So it was interesting because I, I had it in my mind that they would be someone that would be good to go into business for a certain topic or a certain kind of idea. But they don't know that yet. So really, is it important to them or is it just important to me, right? So having those conversations maybe with the people that are part of that item on the list might be a great idea. And maybe ask and find out if they're you know, important to them that task or not, because it may not be something that's on their radar. It might be a number, you know, 10 on their radar, but unfortunately, it's a one on your radar. So, you know, you may find it way more important. Yeah, exactly. I was actually just going to pull up my own old weekly review list so I could share some of the things that I used to do. I know one of the things that I put on my weekly review list was just to plug in, make sure to plug in my e-reader so that it could charge. I would make sure to plug in my iPod so that it would charge and also sync with the com- with the computer as well so I get the latest audios and the podcasts and everything else. Uh, gathering loose papers on desk and processing, same as Michael Hyatt. 
organized purge sort or clean out one thing. Wouldn't that be great for all of us to do? Find a box <laughs> in the basement. Hey, I don't need this anymore. Throw it away. I mean, make a split second decision or as quick as you possibly can because you don't want to waste a lot of time. But, you know, that sometimes that was really hard. It was just like going through an entire drawer of art supplies and going like, I don't, I'm never going to use all these art supplies. I still do some art here and there, but not as much as I used to. Not to say I won't do more in the future, but I just don't need everything that's there right now and somebody could get it get it uh and use it better than i could in that moment so next thing i said was save ideas for later and evernote evernote's just a great digital dumping ground for all of your ideas i was coming up with 10 ideas a week just like james altucher for a while and just having things like you know spread out everywhere in your room on on cards like three by five cards or on your notepad or whatever can kind of get crazy in terms of chaos and you're not going to do all those anyway so it's kind of like the someday maybe list you're just throwing it all in there and Maybe you'll come back to it later. I know people that pull things out of their desk and go, hey, this is the next movie I'm going to make because they have tons and tons and tons of ideas. Organizing and deleting computer files, like I said earlier, that used to be part of my weekly list. Looking at my notes in my moleskin or notebook. Processing unread pages in the browser. Again, something hard for people to do, but you close all those tabs and you feel so much better. So do it every once in a while and sending thank you notes was something I added to the end of, and I didn't always do that as much as I should have, but certainly it's not a bad thing to remember. So mine was like an 11 step process, but again, don't get carried away. Keep it simple. You know, if you like a few things from Michael Hyatt's re weekly review process really doesn't need to be eight steps or 11 steps. It can totally just be three steps and you can do it. So no, 100%. Just find those things that make sense for you and that help you stay organized. You know, we're not saying reorganize your life. We're saying just find ways to organize yourself so you can work more efficiently, right? So you can still keep your desk messy. You know, yeah. we're not, we don't, we don't really have a preference for what you do. Uh, that's your own choice. But make sure that you can still find it. And if one of your managers or let's say your CEO were to come to your desk, you know, how does that reflect on you? Because, you know, it does reflect on you in the way this, the other people see you as well, right? So if you want to be seen mm -hmm. as a higher end employee, not necessarily is that the only reason they see you that way, but it definitely can't hurt you to have a, a desk that's organized or a workspace that's organized, right? Uh, especially, I know you said you used to work in a computer shop. Uh, mm. You know, you look at something like that, you really need to keep that warehouse organized and put things in certain places, right? They couldn't just throw stuff all over the place and be like, yeah, yeah I thought we saw it over there in the right-hand corner, but then somebody moved it to the left. No, it's got its own spot. It's going to stay there. You know, anytime somebody needed it, they take it from the back, put it on the shelf in the front, right? So then people can purchase it. So there's always a system in place for a reason, right? So it keeps it simple. Everybody knows what it's supposed to be, right? We're not saying that everybody should work the same and everybody's desk should be the same. But if you can have it, everybody's as close as possible. Then if I was to have it to, you know, say my computer went down and I got to go work on somebody else's computer, I can sit at their desk and work and have the same famil famil familiarity, similarities or fam I familiarity. There you go. That's what I wanted. Uh, or the similarities as what my desk looked and felt like, right? So you want to be able to make your workspace easy for other people to work in as well, especially if they have to. So I always look at it as if the CEO of my company were to come down from their office and wanted to use my desk, could they work at, in my workspace? And that's kind of how I uh, kept my stuff organized. Such a great point. I love it. And the key word that you say there that maybe some people could have missed is systems. So every company has systems. Some of them are not as developed as they could be or should be. And unfortunately, those are companies where people are overtasked and tend to get stressed out and have too much work to do. Or it's so disorganized that nobody knows what anybody's doing and everybody's running around like chickens with their, with their heads cut off. So in a good organization, you will find systems. Now, the thing that a manager or executive person would find impressive is if you have personal systems for how you handle your work. You didn't necessarily go and get permission and ask them how to set up systems that work for you, but you could just say, hey, here's a checklist. Here's a task that I do every single day. It's repetitive. I do it all the time and I need to do it all the time. Why don't I just create a simple checklist for myself so I remember all the steps, make sure I'm dotting my I's and crossing my T's and everything gets done right the first time, every single time. That makes your life efficient and also appears very impressive to employers. Right. And I love that idea because that's exactly 
exactly what I was doing, right? I had developed my own systems that worked for me. And that's what I was saying, giving the examples of, you know, com- I was able to complete eight hours of work in three and a half hours every day, you know. And most and, people can. And most people can. And I was doing that. But a lot of people I noticed were just kind of dawdling along where I instead said, you know, I'm going to finish my work as quick as I can. And then I spent the rest of the day actually listening to podcasts, taking mm-hmm. notes, developing a business plan to start a podcast. This was a few years back and really understand how that process worked, what kind of mic I needed, what kind of computers would make sense, you know, what kind of uh, everything, you know, all the different parts and all the headsets and and what kind of programs are needed and who was podcasting out there and how are they successful. So I spent my time really understanding and try to understand the marketing side of it. And I utilized my time by not wasting it and then spent the rest of the day looking busy, but really was busy trying to develop my own business plan. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah. So thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Are we ready to move into some final thoughts? Yeah, man, for sure. You go first and uh, let me formulate something to say. (laughs) Great. So the one thing that I wanted to add here was just to plan your work and work your plan. And so people might go, David, which part of that do you think people are missing? And I say all of it. (laughs) <laughs> because people aren't planning their work first. So therefore, th- they think they're working their plan, but they're not. They're just working. They're improvising, essentially. They're going on a stage and saying, this is a Shakespeare play, but I'm going to say what I want to say. You know, you that's not the best way to handle your work. Some people do it that way. I get it. And they just take it blow, 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 blow day by day. But the key thing is most people don't do either. So they don't plan the work now, if you plan your work and don't do anything, you know, at least you planned it. So you know what you got to do, but you haven't done it. But if you plan your work and work your plan, then you're at least sticking to a plan that you've set for yourself. And it doesn't have to be perfect, nor will it ever be perfect. It's the same thing with systems. You can have a checklist for yourself. There's always ways to optimize it, make it better, tweak it better, make it so others would understand it better so they could repeat the process if you gave that process to them. It will never be perfect, but at least plan your work and then work it and then you'll be feel far more organized and accomplished exactly no i love that so um there's not much more I can really say to that other than, you know, I, I enjoyed using lists, uh, learn how to use them properly, find out what works best for you. Like I said, yeah. for me, I just go out Monday to Sunday, I write those words down and I put everything in bullet form uh, that I need to do for those days. Uh, and then I just try to, especially right now with writing at home and blogging, uh, my whole goal right now is to minimize my time of how much time I spend in front of the computer. So my goal is to, you know, about maybe two hours a day is going to be my max is what I want to do. And that's going to include mm. all my social social media, that's going to include my writing, that's going to include all my, uh, you know, going to different forms and, and maybe, uh, you know, responding to comments that other people are leaving. So that's kind of my goal for two hours a day, uh, and then spend the rest of my mornings and doing other stuff, uh, other than just focusing on what needs to be done. But right now, there's a lot of stuff on that list that needs to get done. So one by one, I'm doing it, I've got to make sure that's being done in the right way, right? So I can't say, uh, you know, you change this before I change that because I have to first ensure that the the metrics on and what I've put in place right now makes sense. It's working. If it's not working, I got to figure out why it's not working. And then, but it, it takes time to find those things out, right? So if you're gonna change anything in your system to be organized, give it time to see if it actually makes sense for you. Does it fit into the way you work? And then continue doing it. If it doesn't, find another way that can maybe work. Maybe just tweak it a little bit. Maybe have somebody uh, keep you um, organized for help you stay organized, right? So just find those ways that work for you, implement them, and you'll probably see that your sales are going up, your uh, productivity at work is going up, and uh, you're probably going to be a lot happier with a more cleaner space and a more cleaner headspace as well. You would make a great case study for the music entrepreneur there, Mav. Even though, Even though you're not a music <laughs> entrepreneur, I have a product called 60-Minute Online Marketing Checklist for Musicians. The whole concept is you can kind of do most of it in 60 minutes, like even two hours. If you're trying to build a business, if you're doing it in two hours a day, and it means some people can only afford that time, but that's still impressive. If you're doing all your blogging and posting and posting to social media and interacting on social media done in two hours, that's that's super impressive. And people should know what you can accomplish in that time if you're organized and prepared. Right, for sure. And it's not saying that I'm going to get there right away today, right? So no, right now, I mean, I do thinking spend, about it. Yeah, I already kind of know what I want. I, I don't want to spend uh, eight hours a day on, on the computer in front of a TV or in front of a 
uh, my phone, right? You know, messaging people back and forth and writing blog posts. I know that can be done and my time can be utilized much better elsewhere, maybe developing products and, and helping people in other ways that I would like to help, right? So my goal is obviously to get there. It may take me one year to get there. It might take me a year and a half to get there. But my ultimate goal, kind of like the Tim Ferriss four-hour work week, right? You know, really do want just that four-hour work week in the, in the big picture if it's possible. But I know that it's going to take the right processes, the right systems, put them in place, be organized as possible. And that's the only way I know I will be able to get to where I want because the less organized I am, the more chaos it'll create. That's right. I mean, because you could have the goal of scheduling posts for the next three months, but you may not necessarily get there. You might come close to your goal in, say, two months instead of three months, but that's still at least working your uh, planning your work and working your plan. So Exactly, right? And if there's one week I, I can't, I get sick, right? But at least I have done enough and I have enough maybe stuff in the back where, you know, I can take a day off or two days off. That's the whole idea, right? Even when you're on vacation, yeah. you want to be able to have things posting on your website and yeah. and whatnot. So, and, and new blogs and new podcasts coming out. So, and maybe new products coming out, right? You don't want to always be continuing sitting at your workspace doing it you want to maybe be able to go on vacation sit at the beach maybe spend an hour there uh, and then hit the beach again right i know that's something me and yourself have talked Mm -hmm. about is we'll go do that do a couple podcasts and then hit the day and go see what else you know whatever country we're visiting has to offer so you know we don't want to sit in front of a computer for eight hours trying to figure out how to be organized and and find the best ways to continually do stuff the idea is to have the right process in place tweak that process absolutely because new tools are keep coming out new uh new ways of doing something, uh, new programs, new apps. There's always new information that we you can always apply to yourself, but 90% of the information, if not at least 80% of the information is going to stay true all the time. Exactly. Yeah. Don't get distracted by stuff that doesn't really matter. Killer. All right. Well, this has been Using Your Power. Thanks so much for listening. We want you to interact with us. So come comment on our blog at usingyourpower.com if you'd like in the show notes. You can also use the handy messenger tool, Facebook messenger tool to contact us directly. We know so many more people are using messenger apps out there. You can also comment on our YouTube videos, which are, is a place where you can listen to our podcast as well. And you can also check out our free audio program, 10 Simple Ways to Unleash Your Personal Power. You got it right this time. Awesome, nice. bud. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I figured I got it this time. All right. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for listening. We hope to talk to you soon. Absolutely. Have yourself a wonderful day.